this edition of the Eric Miskell Show. I am Eric Miskell with EMS Now. And today, uh, we're going to be talking to some celebrities here about trends and challenges in SMT. Um, before we jump into that, just some quick housekeeping issues. As always, I am joined down, from down under by my co-host, Phil Stoughton. Uh, anybody attending this webinar will be muted uh, for the duration of the show, just to minimize the background noise. Uh, if you do have questions you'd like to pose, please do so using the question tab at the bottom. And as always, this is being recorded and the session will be rebroadcast probably next week as a feature on EMS Now. So with that said, um, let me introduce our guests. Our guests today, we just, like I said, are some celebrities. And I, I'm not thinking, yeah, you know, it's not Kardashian level, you know, celebrity, but they're not Joni and Chachi either, right? So these are some, <laughs> some people who are known in the industry. They are, uh, we have Phil Zero and Jim Hall of ITM Consulting with us. Many of you know them. Um, Phil was just saying that next year, it'll be 30 year anniversary of ITM Consulting. So that kind of speaks to their, the strength in their stick to in this industry, and they have a wealth of information experience to share with us. So I'm going to shut up and let them let Phil maybe start by introducing ITM Consulting and tell us a little bit about it. Okay, thanks, Eric. And uh, hi out there in uh, TV land. <laughs> How's that for an acronym? Um, yeah, uh, glad to be here. Thank you. We're, uh, we really appreciate it. Um, yeah, as Eric mentioned, ITM has been around about 30 years now, so uh, we like to say that we've proven we're not just uh, consultants as unemployed with briefcases. We really are consultants. We're serious. This is serious stuff. And um, we, uh, our, our area of expertise and focus has been the uh, uh, assembly processes, both through hole and, of course, surface mount. And uh, we, as, as, a, as a company, we help people with troubleshoot problems. Of course, we don't like to call it troubleshooting. Uh, cause that sounds like, you know, repair, appliance repair guy. I like to say, pro, um, what do we say? <laughs> uh, process failure analysis. So, uh, your FA lab will tell you where, what, what, what you're having. Yes, you're having head and pillow. We're the guys that go out and say, well, this is where in your process it's happening. Uh, we do, um, lots of workshops, both at venues such as SMTAI, Apex. Uh, we've been to, uh, a number of them, um, all over the world. And uh, we also uh, very much enjoy doing on-site workshops for mm -hmm. customers because that way we can customize it a little bit towards what, what they're doing, what they're uh, thinking. Uh, Jim and I also do a podcast called um, Board Talk, and mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're, we have a lot of fun with that. And uh, we've also published a book based on the Tales of the Crypt, the Board Talk. Um, aside from that, we help people adjust to new processes, technologies, components, and... Um, yeah, I, I think that's 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 basically what we do. Yeah, and you've been in the industry for more than thirty years, I'm assuming. Yeah, I I, I started out when I was twelve years old. Most kids had a paper route, and uh, I was soldering. Now I've um, I've been in the industry since 1975, and um, you know back, back when it was all through hole. And I like to say I was fortunate enough to be in the industry. Uh, when surface mount um, basically made its debut around 1979-1980 and uh, happened to uh, be here and enjoyed it and um, you know grew with it and uh, haven't has been boring yet I can say that much it's never boring yeah, yeah thank you for that Jim tell us about yourself well I'm a mechanical engineer um, I had uh, way back when I was um, worked in the chemical process industry and then the, the solar industry during the energy crisis of the 70s. But in 1980, I joined a company called HTC. They made this heat system uh, called Vapor Phase. And we did all kinds of things. And uh, um, when I first joined the company, we made, we did uh, soldering of complex plumbing assemblies. We did jewelry, we cured epoxies. Oh yeah, we were doing this thing called soldering, reflow soldering of surface mount parts on fiberglass epoxy circuit boards. And, um, um, you know, that I was interested in all these, these applications, but in, in a year or two, Don Spigarelli, the owner of the company said, 70% of our business is surface mount reflow. Um, this is the horse to ride. We're abandoning everything else. and We're gonna become a reflow company. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point I became, I've been basically an equipment developer and um, 
I also took on the secondary role of advanced applications and training, um, as Phil has talked about. So we, we, we at that point set up the, one of the first uh, free demo labs where you come in and you know, solder some parts and look at them under a microscope and see what this surface mount was all about. And through that, um, I've worked, although I've worked up until coming to ITM, I worked for equipment companies. I've always had that dual role of equipment of his design and advanced applications. And working even from a reflow perspective, um, it forced me or, or allowed me to learn the whole process. And that is the experience, uh, you know, working with a customer to make a reflow of and work for a new process, you had to understand solder paste and placement accuracies and things like that. And that was the background that allowed me to, uh, to join ITM and, and support Phil in uh, all of the activities that he's talked about. Very good. Well, thank you for that. Listen, you guys have seen a lot and it, obviously, you know, equipment has changed. SMT has, has evolved over the last 30 years now. Um, so I'd like to talk you know, about challenges, but before that, I just want to kind of, you know, I just came back from Guadalajara. I got to see some amazing facilities down there and saw some things. Uh, you know, one of the first kind of more low touch factories I'd seen and were very impressive operation. So, that, you know, a lot, it's very different than it was 30 years ago, is my point. So mm -hmm. let, let's start with that. And maybe, Phil, what, what are you seeing as far as the trends, the big trends and what people are doing within the SMT and uh, when we're focused on that aspect of the industry. Okay. Well, one of the cross cuts we get to do, I mean, that really gives us a, a inside view of what's going on at all levels of um, experience, if you will, and all, all, you know, all across the industries, we do process audits and uh, it, it's one of the specialties of, of the house, so to speak. And we actually have two patents on our, our, our procedures. But one of the nice things it does, as well as when we do workshops, but more so process audits, is it gets us in the field. We see what people are doing, what they're hmm. uh, what they're what they're doing right, what they're probably could do be doing better, or how best practices has been evolving and things along those lines. Um, but I guess I guess one of the biggest problems we see, or, or I guess continued trend, is where do you get good people from? And mm. uh, it's it, it's even even I guess even more intense these days uh, post COVID with uh, you know various um, employment trends and or you know things along those lines and and, and it's it's the universal problem everybody's always asking us yeah. about um, that so that's kind of a semi technical problem other trends um, Jim and I were talking the other day how the the uh, one thing one common theme you'll see in this industry as we've observed over the years everything old is new again. And about uh, 30 odd years ago, people were talking about lights out factories. And guess what? We're starting to talk about it again. We talk about it a lot and, uh, and things like, um, uh, you know, autonomous running machines and all that. Um, we were talking about that 30, 35 years ago. And yeah. it's still a trend to get there. We're not there yet. Uh, theoretically, we, we probably could. But, you know, that, that's one trend. And everything, um, you know, tied in and talking to each other. And, uh, uh, it's become even more required that machines do communicate with each other and talk to each other. And hence yeah. the role of artificial intelligence and things along those lines for good uses. Yeah. Are they yeah. are they connected, do you think, Phil, when you look at the, um, you know, the first thing you mentioned is talent shortage. Are people looking to automation as a, as a way to mitigate that shortage, do you think? You know, it's interesting, Phil. I, I think that's a, a subconscious driver, you know. Hmm. Uh, I think I think the other thing is, of course, you know, the more you automate, the more you take away the variabil variabilities of the human yeah. input and things along those lines. So I think I think it's a multi-level thing, but I'm sure even more it's become a catalyst for it. I, yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised. And yeah, and that was my that was my other question with respect to what you said. Do we do we need the same amount of talent as we did before? Are the machines more robust, more perhaps easier to control? Do we, are we able to work with less talent, Jim? What do you think? Can I interrupt you? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, I think that's possible. But what it defines is the need for another level of talent. And that mm. is people who can deal with automated control systems and computerized control systems. And this is a tremendous lack in the industry. People are not, you have, have some companies are big enough. They have an IT department that has some familiarity, but smaller companies don't. And they're trying to struggle with this communication. And, um, you know, for the, we've always known our, our machines for, for 30, 40 years, we've all, we've been in uh, industry 3.0. Every machine has a computer on it. It controls itself. Some of them are highly optimized. They do a great job, but they mm -hmm. don't talk to one another. 
And, and most engineers have realized that there's a lot of data there that could help us, but for the most part, it's been too hard to dig it out in, in near real time to make it effective in optimizing your processes. People are realizing with enterprise level software systems, MOS, MES, um, uh, ERP and so forth, that capability is there. It has existed for a long time. Mm. Right now, uh, what I think see is the biggest trend that I'm really hot on is, is um, getting the machines to communicate with each other so that all this high level software and ultimately leading to AI uh, can take advantage of this data, use it in a robust way in near real time to make effective improvements. And that leads to, you know, we increase productivity. So that means less people, right? And all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I always tell this story. In the 19, late 1980s, I sat in a, uh, an auditorium in a Motorola facility in Schaumburg, Illinois, as the representative from Vitronics Corporation, talking about what we call um, uh, cell control, where we wanted to get all the machines in one cell. And they were, at that point, we were talking about transferring recipes and maintaining mm -hmm. control over that. And um, we failed miserably. We never, because we never were able to address the physical details of the reality of getting these machines to talk to one another. And yeah. we are finally doing that today with the IPC um, you know, based uh, communication protocols and yeah, so forth. Yeah. And we're making great strides. It is difficult. It's hard um, uh, to get one machine, one computer to talk to the other um, because yeah. of simple things like terminology, data structures and things like that. Again, these, you, you buy a placement machine from Fuji. I mean, that software has been in development internally for 30, 40 years. Hmm. And it's, it, it never really worried about talking to anybody but Fuji. But now they yeah. have to talk to Ko Young and other people and so forth. And the problems are significant. <laughs> they're, they're, yeah. they're simple. They're, they're, they're uh, what I call logistical problems. Getting everybody to call everything by the same name, the same thing by the yeah. same name. Getting your data structures, getting your handshakes and so forth. Yeah. But it takes time and it leads back to the, the resources, the technical people who can solve those problems. And, and yeah. we're still lacking in our industry. Yeah, it's curious, isn't it, Jim? Because then it's, you know, it's you've spent all this time working with with people to help them to learn how to use the machines, learn how to use the machines in in concert with each other rather than rather than individual individually. And, and now you, you're probably the ideal person to train the A.I., you, you know, there's there's a requirement there to a new career at my age. age. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just thinking that of the next thirty years for you guys, and uh, <laughs> and what's going what's going to keep you busy. Um, but I think it I think it is really interesting because I think as you do have that digital transformation, you know, bad data in is 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 going to produce bad outcomes. So you've got to make sure that the data is right, but you've also got to make sure that the decisions that are being made by the AI are as smart as the decisions you've been teaching people as operation managers, production managers, operators to um, to make previously. So I think there's um, there's a requirement to take your knowledge and somehow get that into the into the matrix. I'm ready for the data, for the brain data dump anytime. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna plug you guys in somewhere. That's I, I wanted be. to yeah. highlight something you said, Phil. And that is the inter. Why, why do machines have to talk to each other? Because they're interrelationships. Yeah. What happens yeah. in the stencil printer affects what goes on in the reflow and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you, that by, by making those connections, you have an opportunity to do a much higher level of optimization. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people have done a great job of that idea of a, of a two machine feedback loop. Um, and I think that makes sense. But actually, if you look at the job you do when you do a process audit and you look at the whole line, there are some very complex interplays between the various different machines that you consider. And those things are, are that strange thing that the human brain is just freaking awesome at. And that's just taking data from a huge number of places, nuancing them and deciding, you know, what affects what. And you do that every day when you're driving the car, when you're you know, when you're when you're walking and chewing gum at the same time, all those kind of things. Um, so, yeah, I think it's I think it's fascinating. Hey, but, but one, I, go ahead, Jim. Um, you know, yes, our minds are human minds are great and they but they can still only ingest so much data. Yeah, and that is the, 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 the beauty of AI. AI can ingest huge volumes of data. Yeah. If it's good data. 
Mm -hmm. And therefore, they can hopefully find even more higher level interactions and optimizations yeah. than yeah. Or, could, yeah. or even Phil Darrow. Yeah. <laughs> but who? <laughs> you, know, you know, the other thing I want to mention, you know, I mentioned before, you know, everything old is new again. And that's a theme. The other reoccurring theme is some problems just won't go away. And, and uh, we, we can tell you, you know, I would still say statistically, one of the biggest contributions to uh, defects, if you will, since that's really the bottom line, is design for manufacturability. In spite of yeah. all the strides the CAD companies have made, and they've made very you know commendable strides in trying to uh, learn, understand, interface with the assembly process, you still have that disconnect. And we still see a lot, a lot, a lot of defects you know, because of that, that disconnect between design and, uh, uh, and, and process and not yeah, knowing what's going different. on. So, so yeah. How do you, so what do you think is the solution to that? Uh, hire us. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think just continue on the trend, you know, we're, we're, you yeah. know, uh, you're yeah. becoming interfamiliar there. Um, the problem is, you know, the age old problem is design people just don't understand the assembly process. It's yeah. two different worlds, even within assembly. I mean, you've got a, a schism between assembly and test. They're just different groups and different people. I know because yeah. I've worked in both of them and wow, they're, they're a big difference there. Um, yeah. so, you know, having people who have, you know, kind of interfaced in two areas, every once in a while we'll be doing, we'll be doing a workshop somewhere and we'll say any design engineers in the crowd. And usually there aren't. We go, oh, good, we talked about it. But sometimes there are, and it's wow, design people are actually working in assembly or vice versa. So it, it's more of that interconnect. And and the other thing is just just the things progress. I mean, for all the articles and commentaries and everything else on industry 4.0, it's surprised how many companies we see who aren't even at industry 3.0 or barely. Mm -hmm. So you know, for for all the you know rah rah and hype and stuff, uh, we still have ways to go. In a lot of 10 years of 10 years of rah rah and hype and no dividend yet it feels like right and i think right. it feels like that to a lot of ems companies you know we talk about the digital transformation and some companies use the term digital dividend and they just they're just not seeing it yet and um i think maybe when we started it was all a bit vague and a bit cumbersome and not very specific oh. um, so people didn't know where to get started and to what you said jim people have started with the idea of interoperability and the idea of getting everything connected. And I think lot, lots of companies have done well out of the, out of the idea of connecting a lot of machines, but you know, it's, it, it's not as if we've seen a 30% improvement in productivity or a massive reduction in first pass uh, or improvement in first pass yield or anything like that. Is that something that you think people are a bit tired of and disappointed in? I, I would say it's it's wearing their patience, Phil. I absolutely would. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I would even go to say that, uh, you know, the term plug and play <laughs> does not really exist. That, uh, uh, yeah. it does, let's just say, it doesn't manifest itself in our industry. I mean, one area that, that you know, is worth throwing on, because it's one of uh, Jim's of my mutual soapbox, is solder paste inspection, automated solder paste inspection, SPI. And, um, I remember about, about 30 odd years ago, we did a study for MPM. They had just come out with their 2D, DEC had come out with their 2D, and both were working on adaptive closed loop intelligence too. And mm -hmm. um, I remember cyber optics had just come out with their 3D, their Sentry. And we did a study for, for MPM, how many people were doing solder paste inspection at all, even manually. And we found out something is 30 years ago, maybe 7% of the industry was even just doing manual inspection post print. Mm -hmm. Now it's grown. And again, there have been several, uh, landmark, uh, you know, uh, steps taken, development steps taken in the last few years, of course, you know, we like to think, of, like, what has it been about now, 10, 12 years, Co Young kind of set the bar again, and the other, yeah. their competitors oh, are rallying things. to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. One, one of the things about SPI is that we love it when the people automate it, and, you know, any kind, even if they're doing a somewhat semi-automatic system on an AQL oh. base, it's better than nothing, but people are realizing the importance of catching it there you know, we have the rule of 10 and everything else. But here's one of the things, SPI, the good systems, they are not plug and play. There's a very, very steep learning curve. Mm -hmm. And it breaks us har our hearts when we go out, we're doing an audit, and we see a, a, a you know, full-blown, fully automatic uh, SPI machine, and every board is passing. We take a closer look, and it's set for default values from the factory. Why? Because whoever was trained on it has either moved on or wasn't mm. thoroughly trained or has been assigned somewhere else or got hit by a bus. Um, and, and so it, it's, 
it's unskilled, just becomes a very expensive passer. Yeah. And here's this fantastic technology with the potential to be so good. And uh, mm. yeah, so there, there's that end of it too, is, is getting yeah. education and, and, and people learning. But there are yeah. some systems on big, big learning curves. Yeah. Yeah. That. And that's what, you know, that's what Jim was talking to really. It's, it's, it's that shift in talent, shift in skill set, and yeah, that's absolutely. something. Do you guys get involved in training? Do you guys support that, or? <laughs> yeah, I, I, do. I, I, I teach the um, Lean Six Sigma <laughs> courses through um, uh, the SMTA and through Dartmouth University College, and um, mm -hmm. we, we address a number of those those factors there. Okay. Yeah. And All I'm right. going to give you guys a chance to kind of tout your uh, your boot camps here before we close here and we can talk about what you have coming up. Um, but go to the issue you you what you were touching on there too, the whole inspection thing. If I look at kind of evolution in the SMT space, you look at all the, the the advances being made in inspection at you know various types, right? Throughout mm -hmm. this. <laughs> um right. And uh, how do you view that? I mean, it's, 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 it looks like it's making a difference. It, it, it's upping the game and advancing the field. Is it? I, I would yeah. definitely say so, yeah. But Jim, you, you want to qualify that? Yes, but, but the real um, benefits are that everybody's looking at is the, the feedback that Phil was talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm identifying things with these advanced inspection machines. How can I use this data to prevent defects, not mm -hmm. just catch them. Mm -hmm. And um, then you get into the closed loop between the yep. uh, uh, SPI and the stencil printer and so forth. Mm -hmm. And those are where the real big benefits are that people are beginning to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And utilizing that data in the in the right way and then and then putting that data into a bigger system and you utilize it in other ways, which is exactly what you guys do when you when you go look at stuff i'm i'm curious as to what you said before i really like the idea of your um your process audit i think that's awesome because that kind of seems proactive you know come and take a look at what we're doing tell us how we can improve do enough people do that or you know when you spoke earlier in the introduction you talked about um failure analysis is it failure that sparks people to come to you or is it a desire to improve <laughs> Yeah, we we I think we we came up with what the four or five levels of uh, of defect resolution, and mm. level one is ignore it. Maybe it'll go away. You know, yeah. uh, put 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 uh, electrical tape over the check engine light, or turn up the radio so you don't hear that rattle in the back. Uh, level two is try to fix it yourself, and that's appropriate. Hey, we're engineers. You know, we we that's we hired us. Mm. We figured this out. If you can't, then you go to level three, which is uh, try to get the information. Uh, preferably for free. Ask the guy yep. in the next cubicle, uh, look at YouTube some proceedings. Or whatever, yep. And of course the internet, because we all know everything on the internet is true and factual. And uh, but it's kind of hard to find YouTubes on uh, you know tombstoning and uh, or or head and pillow. And then level four is uh finally um call a consultant and yep. uh you know bite the bullet, call a consultant. So uh, but we like to do the uh, as you're saying the health check, so to speak, with the process audit. So a lot of times people call us in. Uh, for defect resolution and process audit aspects of it are, 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 are you know, method of operation. The first thing is getting over mm -hmm. you, take a land. Because the other thing, sometimes in the heat of battle, people forget is everything is interconnected with everything. Mm -hmm. One thing affects the other. But we do what people call us in, kind of like a how are we doing and, uh, uh, you know, what can we do to improve? And, um, you know, I, I tell you, there's always room for improvement. And uh, I like to think we know what we're looking at. A lot of a lot of EMSs are, are, are used to some of their uh, customers auditing uh, their lines and they have a little checklist they go through with God knows where they got it. And, uh, um, and the problem is some of those people, there are some that are really good and qualified, but a lot of those people are, uh, well, let's just say they've never gotten sun, solder paste under their fingernails. Mm -hmm. So they're not really sure what they're looking at, but they check this off in the box. And a term we came up with them is uh, popular mechanics engineers. Everything they learned is from articles and books and the internet. And uh, there, there's, it's not, and, and don't get me wrong, I love popular mechanics as uh, I'm a subscriber, but <coughs> what we're talking about is the paper tigers of engineering. So there's a lot of those and we know what we're looking at, at least we think we do. And, hey, uh, but, but I so, will also add, we're, we're learning all the time. We, we you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's amazing. 
But Phil, when and or Jim, when you go in to do a process audit, you know not all assembly lines are created equal, right? I right. mean, they are they are they are constructed generally, especially if if it's a uh, continual flow, right? To 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 build a certain board a certain way, and and there's a lot of consideration given into that. So when you engage then with with it for somebody for a process audit, is that the first discussion? Then is tell me about your product, tell me what you're doing, tell me what. What's that like for you when you engage with a client? Yeah, well, the, the, the first step that we, we, we typically do is we have a meeting with the uh, key people at the company, engineering, hopefully qualities in there, uh, people like that. And, and kind of we go around, we introduce ourselves or say, you know, we're from IT, I'm not the government, we are here to help you. And uh, that everything is discussed here, stays here. And as we go around and everybody introduces themselves, you know, I'm such a process engineer, I'm, you know, design, I'm, uh, you know, something along those lines. They, they also, we, we invite them, to, is there's any specific problems you're having, bring them up now. And then the next phase uh, of that after the introductory meeting is we go out and we, uh, uh, one of our colleagues at ITM, Bob Clanky, likes to call the walkabout, if, if you'll excuse the expression, Phil. Um, mm -hmm. And basically what we do is we go from doc to stock, from incoming right through, you know, through QA, through the process, uh, right through shipping. And, and then we, we circle around and we hone in on, on the key processes. Uh, and we spend, a, I can tell you, we spend a lot, a lot of time in printing because that's where most of the defects come from. But we look at everything. Mm -hmm. And of course, having mentioned problems or having, we're, we're keeping that in the back of our minds uh, yeah. towards resolution. And um, it's, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's basically the, the gist of it. And then whenever yeah. we're told that, hey, you're doing a setup course, wherever we are, get us over there if you're setting up or changing over a line, because that's the other uh, uh, time waster, as you could say, or, or the thing that, that a lot of people, it's costing people a lot of money. So yeah, uh, yeah and that's basically, then we have a summary meeting. And well, the way we work it, we've tried everything over the years, 30 years of doing process audits, um, you know, where you try to grade things by numbers and, and it still turns out to be semi-subjective. So our method of, of uh, operation is we have three levels of recommendation. Level one, this is urgent, do this or die. This is affecting your yields, it's mm. costing you money, you gotta do this. Level two, um, you're doing this probably adequately, but best practices say you want to do it this way. And that's where the gist of most, most recommendations are, for, fortunately. And then level three, we like to call them science projects. Like, you know, you're using this kind of older X-ray now, and man, you're getting into more BTCs, BJs, you really ought to start saving your allowance for, you know, a big boy machine, things along those lines. Yeah. And those are the recommendations that are somewhat capital intensive. But, uh, but interestingly enough, level one recommendations most of the time are not, uh, um, you know, not not big bucks. There are a lot of procedural yeah. and, and uh, you know, practices that they're doing. What, what part money? of the recommendation? Oh, would I'm part sorry. of the recommendation be relative to the equipment set? Maybe would you consider adding another piece of equipment, another piece of inspection? Jim, you're nodding your head. Are you yeah. not necessarily yeah. a yeah. brand? Yeah. Well, but... that, uh, SPI has been a big one through the years. It's going away now because people mm -hmm. have. But for years, one of our level standard level three was um, consider SPI. evaluating SPI. Yeah. 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 I, one of the things that stands out from one of my visits last week in Guadalajara was, and I won't name the EMS company, but they had a, and I'd never seen it, post oven, a cooling cell before it hit AOI, right? To make mm -hmm. sure that everything was kind of, they said, you know, the oven just wasn't sufficient enough, right? So, and they wanted to make sure and it gave them a better outcome. So if you look at something like that, with maybe that's not right for everybody, but it seemed to me I'd never seen it before, an interesting kind of a process. Mm. Yeah. And it comes from that walk on the factory floor, doesn't it, Jim? And, you know, Eric's talking about his site visits. I, I do them regularly. You just learn so much walking the floor with the guy that's running, running the line. And it's not just what you look at. It's anecdotally what people tell you that you meet on the line, people you talk to, where there's pride, where there's concern, you can see stress at different points. It's for me, it's the first thing I always want to do when I go and visit a company. And, you know, I, I imagine for you guys, with all your expertise, it's way more valuable. Is that something you enjoy, you still enjoy doing, Jim? You must have oh, absolutely. A, lot of, a lot of lines. Absolutely. And, and of course, one of the, the arts of this is to engage all the operators. Hmm. Because when you're down, like you're in this stencil printer, you need to, to, to be 
open communication with the person who's setting it up, who sees the little things. Um, yeah. And that we work very hard at, you know, as Bill said, we're not the government. We're we're here to help you. We're here to work <laughs> together. You know, we're not we're not going to give you a bad report card. Those yeah. kinds of things. But those are, are real important. And when you start out so that people will open up and you can you know, share honest information. Yeah. You yeah, know, it's interesting. Good. You know, I'm no expert like you two guys, but the thing I always look for is clutter and engagement, right? If there's <laughs> clutter, if there's, it, it just makes me nervous in life anyway, but you see a lot of clutter around on, on a, an assembly line. To me, you know, th- that's, that's not a good sign. Do you share that impression or? Oh, I'll let, I'll let Jim, he, our, our resident master black belt, lean six Sigma black belt. Uh, yeah, he's rolling up his sleeves. Yeah. Why you like this topic? Yes, um, um, <laughs> Yeah, we have a in, in Lean Six Sigma, we have a whole technique called 5S. Yep. You probably heard that, you know, oh, yeah. um, uh, sword, separate, um, um, certify, and, and um, I can't even remember them off the top of my head. That's how old I'm getting. But where you go through and you would basically eliminate clutter, eliminate yeah. everything. Yeah. And, then, and the worst place, Eric, is the repair station. Mm. Oh, the, 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 the dirty uh, tools, to one side. The dirty brushes and set and, and wipes and things like that, that are just, you know, probably spreading more contamination than they're removing. Yeah. So, um, all those are, are key signs. For yeah. You must go in sometimes and there are just like red flags that you're, that you're so used to seeing that you, <laughs> yes. you almost recognize them immediately out of the corner of your eye. Mm-hmm. And in some ways they're great because favorite- they're a quick fix. Yeah, one one of our faves is flux bottles. Oh, we hate those flux bottles. And and part of the problem is is that uh, people feel that you know with enough flux you can solder anything to anything, and it kind of uh, you know it's in in lieu of skill. So uh, it's um, we hate to see the flux bottles, and there's really really no need. I mean, basically repair should be done with a a flux cord solder because there you have, you have, you know, it's proportion to flux to the metal. Uh, if you really need something, really need some extra flux pens or uh, 50 grams, say, syringe of solder paste, but slush it on the flux. <laughs> and then, of course, they attempt to clean it or they think they're cleaning it. You know, the old wire brush and the isopropyl. Yeah, that's really cleaning. But as our, <laughs> our, our good friends at Foresight like to say, and, and also our uh, other friends at Kaizen and, uh, and Zestron is, you're not cleaning, you're relocating it. And yeah, so that, that's one of another little of our little pet peeves. We have others, don't we, Jim? Yeah, we we have. Yeah, lots well, of I was I was going to relate one to stencil printing. You know, a lot of people have cleaned up their act in stencil printing. They'll have a, mm. a cart there with all, all the cleaning up um, materials to change the stencils and so forth, and it looks very organized. But when you go over to the machine and you lift the lid, there on the <laughs> side of the machine is a spatula. And it hasn't been cleaned in 10 years. And it's got all this cruddy, dried up solder paste on it. So you have this beautifully nice, pristine machine. And then in comes the tool that's going to come in contact with the solder paste that's got you know, tons of contamination on it. That's, yeah. that's the kind of thing that, that you have to get down, you know, right there to, to mm-hmm. see. But it could yeah. be critical. It could be very critical. Yeah. 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 So are you impressed? Are you, I mean, <clears throat> with the advancement over the last 30 years, you know, I, I hear what you're saying that there are things, but, you know, give us some hope here, guys. I mean, it, things are certainly getting <laughs> yeah, what about the industry getting better, right? right? So, yeah, well, I, I would like to talk, I, I'll yeah. throw it on to you guys. You have something. And that is the um, recent improvement of handling replenishment of components to the pick and place machines. Because this has been, we've been identified this as one of the big time losers. You know, a reel of components runs out, the machine stops, the line stops. And you throw, and all that capacity gets thrown away, never to be returned. Um, And we're seeing that people have picked up on this and a whole variety of equipment from, you know, enterprise level systems with guided vehicles to simple uh, racks of components with LEDs on each one linked to the Mm -hmm. placement machine and when a, when a reel goes out, a light goes out. And so the operator can come over and just grab that, that reel off the, off the local rack and put it right on to speed up and slow down that, um, that loss, that downtime related to um, component um, shortages and outages. Mm-hmm. And I think that we've done a really good thing. And I'm impressed with the variety of equipment, again, from very simple to very complex, that um, yeah. seems to be addressing that problem. Yeah, and that materials handling has been incredibly important in the last... 12 months where getting components oh, yes. onto the line has suddenly become the difference between 
having some stuff to build today and maybe not having stuff to build just because one or two one or two components are short. One of the things I'm really curious to ask you about is do people look to you for fixing the minutia or do they look to you advice for you? for advice on the big picture. I think about what you guys have done over the last 30 years and, and all you've seen. And I'd think, okay, well, these guys can fix this little problem if it's gone wrong. But these guys are the wise sages of the industry that if I'm changing my technology roadmap, if I'm looking at introducing a brand new disruptive technology, if I'm looking at shifting my strategy in terms of moving into a different market that has different requirements, Surely I could get some uh, Phil and Jim's time and they would say, hey, if you're going to do that, don't forget this. Or if you're going to do that, what about this? Or just don't freaking do that. Do people <laughs> do people ask you those big questions or is it always, hey, you know, the stove's on fire. Come around and put it out. <laughs> it's it's a little both. I mean, I mean, sometimes we, we get it right in the big picture. Of somebody setting up a line or, or evolving mm -hmm. their line. Uh, I wish it was more often. Uh, because a lot of times we'll go in, we'll go in and you know, we'll do a process on it. And you know, we might talk about it and say, oh, my God, look what they bought. Oh, geez. And some salesmen <laughs> sold them a bill of goods. You know, well, well we're not that overt about it. But, uh, you know, it's just like you know, we see things that might have been done better and mm. wish we had input on it, that kind of thing. But, but yeah, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of both. But I, uh, uh, I and, and sometimes the other is incidental. You know, we're doing a process audit, well, but they'll start asking us about well, what do you think of this? What do you think of solder jetting? What do you think of this? You know, do you think mm. it would fit here? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We love it because that's uh, because and that means all the gears are turning. People are thinking. Yeah. You know, they're, yeah. They're, all cylinders are sparking. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, and are, are there any big disruptive technologies over the last few years that you thought? Hey, we just need to tell people about that. You know that that's that's a game changer. You know, you mentioned things like selective soldering or robotic soldering, or any, mm. uh, are there things that you've seen come into the industry that you thought actually that's going to make life easier for everybody, and not everybody knows about it? Well, to improve solder paste formulation. Ah, yes. You yes. will not believe how many people or have new equipment and are using an old solder paste that was designed and formulated before a BTC component even existed. Yeah. And then they, and, and you know, the, the solder paste companies are, are in very competitive. It's capitalism at its best, mm -hmm. trying to outdo each other to solve these problems. And people will, you know, be sitting there struggling with a problem that there may be a different formula solder paste could solve from the, from the right beginning. In, you know, yeah. Is that's solder, a big one we, we, we struggle with. And it's because solder paste evaluations are hard. Changing over a solder paste is a big deal. And we yeah. have, a, we have um, you know, we'll help people do that and have some guidelines and we things. We love that. That yeah. we can uh, help them do that. I mean, and I guess you've got to tell your customer and your customer's customer. And, you know, there's a there's a whole audit trail that goes around making a change like a solder paste. Right. Yeah. It depends on the product, whether, you know, they have to revalidate materials, things like mm -hmm. that. But as, as Jim says, I, you know, solder paste is a commodity, but it's not a commodity. They are not all created equal. And if you've yeah. ever done a solder paste evaluation, it becomes incredibly, you know, there, there are some companies always, you know, always fall, fall out on the top tier when we're doing our evaluations. A lot of mediocre stuff and there's some i can't say it'd be a real crap out there that, that hmm. the material itself is generating defects and when we one of the questions we ask we do a process order okay i see you're using such and such um how did you come to use that and there's a couple of answers we get uh one is that uh well we've used it ever since i've been here and i've been here seven years wow you don't think that maybe with all the r d going in and all the solder companies in the competition don't you I think maybe somebody would have come out with something better. The other is we like the salesman. We call that the salesman gives good lunch. And the yeah. third one we sometimes is, well, we did an evaluation using the test, whether the IPC or the ITM test. We did it in our facility using our equipment. And this is the, the one we selected does the best in our environment. Boy, we like to hear that. Not often enough. Yeah. Yeah. And then you wonder why the crappy materials are actually out there because <laughs> they didn't do an evaluation. Yeah. But the solder paste companies, we, I mean, we, we keep pretty close here to that and, and, and with them. And uh, the better companies are always one-upping each other on this. You know, yeah, here's how we're going to approach graping. Here's going to do it. And until in the materials themselves here, we're going to make a wider process window in reflow. And there's so much competition. And I, I just think, you know, we think that solder paste is kind of taken for granted. And 
Yeah. They like to make the equation, you know, it's solder paste is to your board. Solder is to your board what, what blood is to your body. It's doing a lot yeah. of stuff there. Hey, what about the uh, the cleaning processes? Mm. What do it's, you think of... Go ahead. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I see that smirk. Well, you know, nobody wants to clean. I mean, no clean is such a, an advantage. It eliminates all of the problems that um, people hang on to that. Um, but... The need to clean when you when you do need to clean is um, very more complex, like everything else, because things are getting smaller and closer together, so it's getting hard to clean them. And the materials are more complex. Higher temperatures for lead-free alloys also makes cleaning harder. So that there's that. And um, uh, um, again, there's a lot of chemistry out there that uh, the, the, the uh, Kaizen and Zestron are, are doing a wonderful job inventing lots of stuff, but. Is everybody taking advantage of that? Um, I think cleaning is something that many people, um, I mean, we, we get in seminars and, and we, we have people who are working in the industry have never seen a cleaner <laughs> because, because they, they work in a no clean shop. So um, that's a, um, kind of a complex issue because, and it, it, when you get down to cleaning specific uh, residues under specific component geometries, you know, there's, there's a, a wealth of, of uh, equipment um, and um, uh, cleaning materials to help you do that. So um, you need to devote the again, once again devote the resources to make a, a good evaluation. I will point out that most of the the chemical people will give you, have wonderful laboratories to help you do that. Okay. Yeah. Listen, and, and, and again, one of the game changers, I mean, when we first saw people starting to clean, no clean, you go, well, that sounds like an oxymoron or it's, or it's a way for Zestron and Kaizen to sell more materials. But the reality is the game changer was lead free because as, as Jim mentioned, the reformulations of the fluxes to deal with an additional 30, 35 degrees, sometimes greater, uh, it affected things. And uh, let's just say there's a lot of people doing conformal coating and it, it radically affected adhesion to the no clean residue of, of a lot of the conformal coatings. So that's another major driver why people are, are cleaning no clean. And most of the R&D, since I think about 75% of the market is using no clean, whether they're cleaning it or not, but using no clean. And that's that's where most of the R&D among the solder companies are going in with their formulations because that's where the market is. They're shooting mm. for no clean. So uh, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Listen, Bill, Bill, you asked about disruptive technologies and one that, that Phil, Phil Zaro mentioned just a minute ago that we struggle with, and that is a, a, a subset of additive manufacturing uh, 3D printing is solder paste printing or, or solder jetting. Yeah, and it has tremendous capabilities, but people, it, you know, it's it's slow and it's expensive. So, um, where people are struggling to uh, um, find the right niche for that, and when uh, deciding when they should invest in that, we try to help yeah. them with that. We we worked with those. I think we worked on the very first um, my well, it was my data in those days that came into this country and helped them. Yeah, my chronic now implement yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Hey, listen, before before we end here, I wanted to give you guys a, a chance to kind of tout your boot camps. You guys are, are <laughs> that's you know, you go around to these shows. You mentioned that you have your boot camps that you do. Tell us uh, kind of in brief uh, what those are, who should attend and when are your next ones? OK, well, I guess our, our three uh, headlining uh, workshops that we do now, uh, the boot camp is a two day uh, a workshop. Uh, we've given it really all over the world. We did, I did a tour in Australia and New Zealand a few years ago. Uh, uh, and and, and we, we've given them, most of the time we're doing it in companies. And um, what it is, it's basically a, uh, um, I could even say a boot camp. And uh, it basically goes into the basics fairly comprehensively too, isn't it? Just skimming over this stuff. And the idea here is for newbies, uh, it's a great way to come up to speed to what we're doing or attempt to come up to speed and understand all the different processes and nuances. For uh, older veterans, it kind of fills in the gaps, but a number of people tell us that. So that's our boot camp. We have another uh, um, uh, workshop that we've done for quite a few years. Of course, we're always, you know, uh, freshening these up, things up, and that's best practices. And uh, oddly enough, that was an offshoot of a seminar we, we did many, many years ago with some of the SMTA chapters, chapters called The Deadly Sins of SMT. So we're saying, well, this is what you shouldn't be doing. Let's talk about what you should do. So we've done best practices, and uh, we've done that at a number, a number of the big uh, shows and venues. And then um, there's, there's a few others, but the, um, the newest one we've done, we've put together, 
is, is called troubleshooting. Well, uh, we call it troubleshooting, but it's based on uh, uh, board talk. And uh, we call it, you know, we, we, we published a book. We actually took a look back, all of a sudden surprised us about a couple of years ago, we've been doing board talk for 10 years. And uh, at that point in time, we had over 200 episodes. Yeah. And one of the interesting things is that um, our, our, our publisher at Circuit Insight plays the old ones over again. And there were some from you know, 10 years earlier, and it was still apropos. Uh, mm. So either it was really good, timely information, or we were really vague. You, you take your pick. <laughs> but um, we like people to listen. Just to and, and we also like the fact that people write in and say, hey, yeah. you bozos didn't mention this, or hey, write on the money, or hey, let me tell you yeah. about my product. So uh, yeah. we, we really uh, like the feedback. So we actually put together a book uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it's Tales from the Crypt of Board Talk or Troubleshooting. We believe it's the only book out there, you know, contemporary book on troubleshooting, interesting enough, in the SMT processes. So mm -hmm. we did a workshop, based a workshop on it, and uh, we'll be doing the uh, the whole lineup there at uh, uh, through STI, our favorite FA lab, in um, Madison, uh, Alabama, uh, it was the week after next, and mm -hmm. um, I think that's what it is. And we'll be doing we'll be doing boot camp, doing best practices. We'll be doing troubleshooting, so people could select that one. And our good friend Mark Mabine will be talking about some of the new advances in cleaning and cleaning testing. So it's uh, you can sign up for all five days or several days, and. Yeah. Uh, that's STI in Madison, Alabama. And yeah. uh, I guess we'll also be doing the troubleshooting at uh, Apex next year, correct, Jim? Yes. Jim took care of yeah. that. So so we go. have we have other workshops too. I'll, I'll mention one other one because we don't give it off enough, but we love it. It's it's basically uh, on DFM and it's DFM from a assembler's point of view. And we'll go in and give this. And of course the designers are there and they're thinking, okay, assembly boy, what are you gonna tell us? But in the meantime, <laughs> the, the manufacturing process guys who wanted us to come in and we'll be giving it, and you know, Jim will make a point, and there's guys go, see, we told you guys I was the case. What you listen to? It? <laughs> it's great. Okay, okay, break it up, spread it out. Yeah, but spread we, out. You, you guys on that side. You guys on that side. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's talking about process mediation, boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Among the rest. So as you can see, we we're passionate about what we do. We really enjoy everything mm. we do, and uh, probably why we still haven't gotten around to retiring. <laughs> it's <laughs> having too much fun most of the time. Too much fun, and there's yeah, still plenty to do. Yeah. yeah, it's not like it's all fixed yet, is it? Not no. yet. Not yet. No, <laughs> it's it's still exciting as he is. As I think all four of us agree, we learn something new almost every day. Yeah, something every day is a school day. Something's happening. Sure. It's fantastic. What a yeah. great industry to be in. Yeah, no. it doesn't pay much, but it's a good industry to be in. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, you almost ended on a good note there, Phil. It doesn't pay much. So, uh, oh, yeah. Good. <laughs> Phil, any comments from you before we wrap? Stoughton? No, no, I thought it was, I, th I think it's really interesting. What I what I am fascinated about and what I would encourage anybody to do is talk to these two guys. When you, when you, when you are doing something new, when you're making some big changes, rather than wait till it all blows up in your face, you know, get there as early as you can. The sooner, the sooner yes. you engage with these guys, probably the less you're going to spend with them. But you know, the less, the less you're going to spend on the problem. So, you know, get, get in there early and, and, and use that 30 years of experience doing, you know, it, it's what we talked about with, um, with the whole idea of AI, the whole idea of AI and big data is to use your data, but also have this huge amount of crowdsourced data. And, you know, you've seen what's happening on your line. You've seen what's happening on your factory, um, these guys have seen what's happening in numerous factories, numerous industries with numerous different products. They've probably seen pretty much every problem that you're going to see. Um, and they're, they're probably able to see a problem before it occurs. So, yeah, get in early, ask the big picture questions and uh, and it will doubtless help. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Well, I tell you, my big takeaway from this, and I'm going to use the line, Phil, is uh, that salesman gives good lunch. Um, I, think that that's, uh, I actually wrote that down. That was <laughs> it's your new bumper sticker. New bumper sticker. I think it applies in a lot of industries, right? That's not the new sadly, dollars. sadly, yeah, isn't it? Listen, guys, I want to thank you. You guys are you do a great service for the industry, and I can't uh, echo what Phil's comments are. Absolutely right. These are these are guys I've known them for years, and I've actually I attended. Uh, I think it was in Fort Worth that I attended one of your workshops. So. Yeah. yeah, I think it was the Deadly Sins one, actually. So if oh. I remember correctly, so that was the one that tempted you the most, was it, Eric? 
Yes, it was. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, well, thank you. You guys are also doing the industry a fantastic service, and it's very much appreciated among the masses. So again, thanks. And this was this was fun. Thank you, guys. And, and Phil, thank you for getting up so early uh, down there. No, absolute pleasure. Absolute yeah. pleasure. It's, it's, it's a great way to start my day. Thank you. Yeah. Great. yeah. All right, gentlemen, hopefully we uh, good luck. Enjoy the fourth quarter and hopefully we can do this again sometime. And I hope to see you maybe at Apex is I'll make a point of, of seeing you there. So excellent. Very Great. good. Thank you. Doug. Okay. Thank Thanks, you guys. guys. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.